Hello and welcome and thank you for joining me today. My name is Tony Clover and I work as an associate for Helen Sanderson Associates. Today's webinar is webinar number two in a series of five. Webinar one is still available for download via YouTube or you can contact us here at Helen Sanderson Associates. We will have time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, but please do feel free to submit any questions that you may have as we go along. You should be able to type them into a box that you can see in front of you. This webinar will be recorded and will be made available on request. I'm also going to be creating a list of useful references, things that I'm going to talk about or refer to as we go through, and these are going to also be available upon request. We might put them onto Facebook if you're looking for them. In today's webinar, we're going to look at how we can use person-centered thinking and person-centered thinking tools to help us to work alongside people living with dementia to co-produce outcomes that have meaning for them. We will look at how outcomes have been used to drive change and maybe reflect on how more can be done. On the way, we'll be thinking about relationships, their value, and how person-centered thinking can both enable and sustain relationships between those receiving support and those giving it. On the screen, you can see one of my favorite quotes. And as we go through, we will be discussing friendship as a form of social capital. Le Chardin was a French philosopher. He also wrote, everything is a sum of the past. Nothing is comprehensible except through its history. This leads us to recognize the importance of knowing and acting upon a person's history. To be able to construct circles of support, we need to know and act upon a person's life experiences. To know a person's life experiences, we need to listen to their story and try to understand just how it's been constructed. We then need to work alongside them to create opportunities for their story to continue in ways that has meaning for them. Back in 2010, on the back of the National Dementia Strategy and the Department of Health Outcomes, the Dementia Action Alliance published seven collaborative outcomes written in collaboration with people living with dementia. It's hoped, um, the statements hope that, by, by, that these should all apply to people living with dementia by 2014. In this graphic, you can see how we've linked four of those key statements to person-centered thinking tools. There has been a lot of social movement since the publication of the Dementia Outcomes. Now the goal for health and social care services should be co-production. And this fabulous graphic from Graphics on the Go describes for me the change that has already happened but is still also underway in health and social care. Co-production starts from the idea that no one group or person is more important than any other group or person. Everybody's equal. Everybody has assets that they bring to the process. Assets refer to skills, abilities, maybe time, and other qualities that people have. This is different from approaches that focus on people's problems and what they can't do. Services for people living with dementia have historically been focused on assessing what they cannot achieve. Their loss of memory, their loss of functional skill, perhaps their inability to live alone. Solutions have then been provided through services that are generally coordinated in nature, with people being slotted into available services with a view to doing to the person. However, if we focus only on what the person cannot do, we can lose sight of all that they can do, not just lose sight of, but undermine and diminish those skills and assets. For some, cooperation appears a comfortable midway compromise. But my reservation is that cooperation may be interpreted as the person's cooperating with the service, whatever they have to offer. Willing to receive can also be seen by some as willing to receive anything. Whilst we do want to shout about co-production from the highest rooftop, it doesn't have to be a song and dance. It does need services to think differently and commissioners of services to be flexible enough to enable that different provision. I see a lot of movement generally towards co-production at scale, but also feel that we need to focus on what's important at a very local and individual level. But this is not about just creating good paperwork or new assessments. 
and it's certainly not about developing a new system of documentation written ostensibly in the first person by another person's hand. That would be lip service. And without understanding, can lead to plans of care that include such erroneous statements as, as I've heard recently, I don't understand that I have to take my medication to stop me being aggressive. No, it's not about writing differently or writing different things. It's about handing over the pen. So many services today are still based on the principles of coordination and transition to co-production may not be as easy as it sounds. It does require a paradigm shift in thinking that can only come about with the recognition that people living with dementia are citizens, not passive recipients of care. Bartlett and O'Connor help us with this thinking by showing how the tra traditional Kit Woodian vision of psychological need can evolve to support citizenship. Here we see the elements necessary for citizenship to be achieved. The central point is a position where the person is free from all forms of discrimination, then going around it in no particular order. We have growth, a movement away from simply being physically and psychologically comfortable to the opportunity for stretch with others acknowledging and respecting the inherent risk that that will entail. So, not just having identity recognized by others, which can be reliant upon discrete roles, but a sense of self derived from multiple and coexisting identities. Purpose. The need for occupation is recognized, but that is commonly provided through coordinated activity. What we all need beyond being occupied is a sense of purpose and a reason to act. Participation goes beyond inclusion of a person in a setting or in the decisions about their care, as including retains the potential to render the person passive to the decisions. Particip participation speaks of agency, without a reliance upon the permission to take part. And solidarity is about uniting together to make that change. Now this may sound like we're playing with words, but it isn't. It's about recognizing the rights of the person, and not just about how others see them, but how they see themselves. It's about working alongside that person, and person-centered thinking tools are the vehicles that help us to drive that transformation. So, let's go back and look at each of those four outcomes highlighted from the Dementia Action Alliance and look at how these can be achieved and how the presence of person-centered thinking tools can help to take that further. Muted. The first of the outcomes we will look at is I have personal choice and control or influence over the decisions about me. The person-centered thinking tools that support this are one-page profiles, communication charts and decision-making agreements. The Dementia Action Alliance sees choice and control as also encompassing end-of-life care with a subtext that people should be confident to know that they will die free from pain and free from fear and with dignity, cared for by people who are trained and supported in high quality palliative care. In this webinar and in the one previously, I ask that we all reflect on how much we talk with a person. Engage them as an equal. I feel in many settings we have some way to go in building ordinary conversations. Conversations about the weather, the dog, the news. We have further to go when it comes to talking with the person about how they wish to live their life until the end. In some settings, many settings, I've seen where planning for the future in services for people living with dementia means really planning about what we're going to do with the person's body when they've died. We have two defaults. We're alive or we're dead. And we're alive until we're dead. Okay? So choice and control has to extend throughout life, up until the very last millisecond of life, and then a little bit further. The National Council for Palliative Care offers some fantastic resources to support conversations for people living with dementia about their end of life. At Helen Sanderson Associates, we've also developed a number of really useful resources and training data to support organisations to co-develop personalised end of life care, as well as support to measure how these are implemented and their impact on wellbeing. 
Hopes and fears are also one of the tools that we can use, either in our hands or in our heads, to help us to explore how a person might be feeling about their future. To be able to talk openly and genuinely with each other, though, we have to be comfortable with talking about our own mortality. Before I ask staff to think about talking with the people they support, I ask them to think about their own hopes and fears about their own life end. Talking about sex doesn't make you pregnant. It gives you an understanding of the mechanics, and with knowledge comes power. With power comes a greater freedom of choice. Talking about dying won't kill you, but knowledge is power, and the knowledge gained through an honest conversation may generate a shift in power that creates greater freedom of choice for people. But it's also about how we're going to live until we get there. Hopes for the future are also about dreaming, perhaps about having new experiences, or perhaps about actions that make the existing experiences feel familiar and safe. It's not just about utilising the skills that we already have, maybe knitting or baking. It's about hopes and aspirations. What would you want to know or learn to be able to do? And then the question, can this be taught by somebody living with dementia in the setting? Or is it something that you and that person can go and learn together? The best recipe, many of you know that I bake a great deal, the best recipe I've ever had for marble cake came from a lady in a care home who, she was handed a piece of cake that was so evidently shop-bought. She put it down in rage. She hunted down the cook and remonstrated with her for about five minutes. After a very open and honest discussion, they sat down together over a cup of coffee and the lady shared her knowledge of baking. I simply sat down with my notebook and took notes. But it's also about going swimming in the local pool. It's about sitting in the wine bar with a book and a glass of wine. It's about keeping up with your own football team. This is where we see the growth aspect of having citizenship acknowledged. But it's also about taking what other people may perceive as a risk. For example, going to the pub for a beer, making friends in that pub, but then people from the pub walking up to the care home to fetch you to go to the pub. Ordinary life for many people. But if you lived in a care setting, that may require an extensive risk assessment, which would probably be signed by other people. The second outcome we're going to look at is, I know the services are designed around me and my needs. This includes the subtext, staff understand a lot about me and my disability and know what helps me to cope and enjoy the best quality of life every day. People who offer support would never expect a person with a broken leg to run, nor would we put their food out of reach simply to stimulate their movement. But so many times, inadvertently, we may ask a person with, da with dementia with damage to their brain to run. Understanding a person's disability and reshaping the environment and approach to support them links to the purpose element of the citizenship model. You may well have seen something very similar to this. It's an activity board. It highlights the day, the date, and shows what will be on offer throughout the week. How do you feel about it? Yeah, is it good? Shows a very busy time, doesn't it? On one level, it does look up a really busy schedule. But the thought, the reflection is, this may be the activity schedule for 28 people in this setting. People may be given a choice as to whether or not they attend, but how do you know you want pink if you're only offered green and yellow? And also, who decides on the activities that are available to choose from? Are these on offer because they're available, or are they on offer because they fit to what people want to do? A coordinated approach is to create activity and then just slot people in it. If this happens, we may then hear comments about people either not taking part or who are described as disruptive once they are in an activity. I personally would be disruptive if I was brought along to a craft session. I would be more so if I was brought along to watch other people in a craft session. It is true, I do have to plan my hairdresser's appointment. I can't just turn up. But I tend not to plan when to turn the radio on or when to read a book. But I like to know that I have the options to do so whenever I choose. I can read a book in my, whenever I choose to, whenever I choose to. I just, books in my house are literally at arm's length. They're everywhere. What about the objects available for people we support? Can they reach out, take hold of, and use objects where they are? Is the space designed to live in or as a showcase of how people might live? 
Now, some people may enjoy this program, and that's absolutely fine too. After all, this is all about choice, but it's also about evidencing how you constructed that choice. There's another way. This is Mohammed's perfect week. There are planned activities. There's also downtime, but the activities have been developed from the conversations building his one-page profile, from knowing and acting upon what is important to him, his hobbies and his interests, as well as his hopes and his dreams. It's as important for Mohammed to have purposeful activities scheduled in as it is to have space for spontaneity and chill time. Chill time is really as fundamentally as important as work time. The development of individual activity plans can lead to other things that they're not standalone. In one care setting I was working in, the one-page profile meetings were beginning to identify that a number of the people there who we supported still wanted to be involved in cooking and food preparation. So, very simple, the work schedule was readjusted. So the people who would be eating dinner were involved in making dinner. After all, isn't that what happens in your household? I was lucky enough to be observing, using dementia care mapping. On one such occasion, what I saw was fabulous. There's about 10 people sitting at three tables having a trifle making competition. It was just so much fun to watch. It looked hilarious fun to take part. There was so much laughter, huge amounts of innuendo, an incredible amount of ingredient tasting, and at the end of it, three fabulous trifles for tea. We talk about outcomes. Yeah, we need large scale social movement, but we also need trifles. The third outcome we want to look at is for people to be able to say, I have a sense of belonging and of being valued part of family, community and civic life. This links to both the participation and social position elements of the citizenship model. This week, it has been announced that the Dementia Friends movement has reached its initial target of one million Dementia Friends. Woohoo! This is great. There are also a growing number of Dementia Friendly communities and this is also really exciting. I'm really hopeful for the future. But it's also about making all communities friendly. To do so, you know, we might need to take a step back and think about what we actually perceive as community. This is part of my relationship circle. I'm not good enough at graphics to be able to display all my friends and significant connections for you. But you can get the gist of the idea here. Those who are closest to me are near the center. Those less so are further out. It may be helpful, I don't know if you have already, but if you haven't done so, draw your own relationship circle. Fill it in. Look at who's in your life. Who makes your life complete? Who could you not live without? Whose support could you not manage without? Cover up. Now, once you've written it, put your hand over and cover up the most significant people in your life. How would it be to feel, how would it feel to live without them? Then cover up your work and your hobby section. What meaning or purpose are you left with? Now, once you've done that, I want you to visualize the relationship circle of the people you support living with dementia. The first thing to think about when we do that is the layout of the circle. What sections have been included, what sections haven't? For example, have we automatically included a work section? If not, why not? Is this about how we define work, perhaps as being paid or, or of social value? And what about hobbies? Are hobbies the same things as activities? For people living with dementia, they may also have another section titled paid support. People are paid to su provide support to or for the person. Okay, once we've drawn the map, how are we going to populate it? Think about the people you support. How densely do you think their circle will be populated? As dense as yours? As we age, we lose some density naturally of our connections. But it's not the number, but the strength of the connections that remain that matters. For some people living with dementia in some care settings, the connections that remain are with paid staff only. But what about the idea of staff as friends? Yes, we must have fabulous relationships with the people we support. But do you see the person when you're not paid to do so? What about neighbourhoods, the concepts of neighbourhood? Do we know who the person's existing neighbours are or who their previous neighbours were? There are times when I've seen um, neighbours and neighbourhood relationships dismissed as not as important as family. 
but I know in reality that neighbours can make the difference between living in community and living as part of community. Do you know, for some people that's the difference between life and death. And then if we're looking at care settings, how do we create that sense of neighbourhood in a care setting? Who knows their neighbours along the corridor? What do we do to generate opportunities for that social connection? I want to thank um, Pippa Kelly for sharing and talking about concepts of dementia farms across Twitter a couple of weeks ago. Um, her blog is fabulous, well worth um, a follow, and it will be on the resource list to you as well. Because community has both micro and macro connections. The micro, the person's connections, their life, their, their, the um, interpersonal connections they have, who they reach at the end of their hands. But there's macro, and that's the community that surrounds them and all the potential connections that it holds. One of those potential connections is a dementia farm. In the UK, we have 230 farms that offer visiting and support services. They, they group themselves together. They sit under an umbrella of um, organisations called Care Farming UK. Whilst historically their primary function has, has, or focus has been on the support of vulnerable children and adults, there's a small but growing movement towards their services being available to people living with dementia. Um, there's a fabulous report recently published um, by Let Nature Feed Your Senses, and a link to that report is going to be on your uh, resource list as well. But community is also about moving beyond presence to contribution. Being visible is part of being present, but being heard and acknowledged and having agency to make change is contribution. I have the privilege of knowing some of the contributors to this book. It's a great read. It's available from the Alzheimer's Society, but it's more than entertainment. It's a celebration of life and personal achievement. The book has been written by members of a group called the Forget Me Nots, brought together by all having, they all have dementia. As well as supporting one another, the group acts as experts by experience delivering awareness training to NHS and social care staff and members of the public. They are currently involved in a program of awareness sessions developed by for GP surgeries and pharmacy receptionists. Their input has already changed how surgery systems operate, for example by highlighting how the electronic signing-in machine just doesn't work for people and how we need to have a flexibility for face-to-face. Or for, for some services have now introduced drop-down boxes so when the person signs in at the reception desk there's a drop-down box that says, be mindful, this person has dementia, please um, slow down your conversations or make sure that they've understood. Don't, don't point them down the corridor, or give them instructions of how to get there, or take them to the meeting room. Now, the last outcome that we will look at is for people living with dementia to be able to say that they have support that helps them to live their life, including subtext about being able to say with confidence they can choose what support suits them best so that they don't feel a burden. Now we've left this till last, it's the last outcome, but it should also be our starting point in thinking about change and needs to be considered and plan implemented as an underpin almost to any pre-levels pre of co-production. In highlighting the end of the National Dementia Strategy and in drawing our attention to the imminent end of the Prime Minister's challenge, the all-party parliamentary group on dementia has very recently published its manifesto for the next parliament. Out of the five targets, the third is to increase the status of care work. Although we are talking about staff towards the end of this webinar, personalised support is not possible if we don't start by looking at how we support our staff. Meet Abby. I met Abby on the morning of her first day of her new job as a deputy manager of a care setting. She was a little bit nervous. This was her first role in a management position. She was, by her own admissions, very young. She'd worked really hard and pushed herself to achieve the qualifications she had. She wanted to fit it in, but she wanted to fit in quickly so that her newness did not distract from all the other changes that were underway across the home. We completed her one-page profile that morning, and by the end of the day, we began to share it in hard and electronic copy. It was on display, it was given to staff, given to the people that lived in the setting. It was shared with families through post or through electronic means. It was shared with GP surgeries, district nurse clinics, the local care management team and the inspector from CQC. By the end of the week, Abby was part of the team. Colleagues stopped her in the corridor to talk about her profile. They talked about their shared interests. Families recognised her as they walked through the door. 
allied professionals had a face to the name. But the one-page profile is, is more than introduction. It's the starting point of so much more. To achieve personalised support, everybody in the care setting must have their one-page profile, staff, unpaid staff, as well as people they support. We can then use the one-page profile, but importantly the conversations that went to build them to match people based on their likes, their skills and attributes, as well as their hopes and dreams. I developed a one-page profile for Sophia once. She told me she'd always wanted to learn to knit, but she never managed. No problem. Marcia, who lived in the setting, could knit. Marcia had some difficulties with her words, but she could knit beautifully. Sophia was a keen observer, and Marcia proved to be a really patient teacher, slowing her actions as Sophia tried to copy her. How would you want staff allocated? Would you be happy with it being based on the number of the room you happen to be living in, or based on the skills and attributes of the person delivering support? The development of each, each member of staff's one-page profile is key to the personalization of services, which, as we said, is fundamental if services are to be ready to co-produce care and support. The development should not be an, an interview process, but should mirror the principles of reciprocity. This is about how the richness then is of the richness of information is gained and how it's shared and utilized. As well as acknowledging what is important to and how best to support staff, we must also develop skills in gaining, giving and receiving appreciation. Today's task, let's start with ourselves. Tell people around you at work what you appreciate about them. Look them in the eye, be genuine, be the change we want to see. Personalisation, as we've seen, is all about relationships held within a framework that supports relational care, the system that holds reciprocity at its core. Buber, a philosopher, tells us that human life finds its meaningfulness in relationships. But he also describes and goes on to talk about how teachers learn from their students. I, I, I believe this. Similarly, those of us supporting people living with dementia to hold on to who they are, we learn so much more about ourselves in the process. So why do we need person-centred teams? To deliver truly personalised support, person-centred thinking must be more than a strap line or a selling point. It must be built into the DNA of the organisation. It must influence retention, recruitment, interview, induction, training, appraisal, mentoring, coaching, supervision, the rotors, leave formats, team meetings, board meetings. The list is endless. Everybody working in health and social care should meet minimum training and skill requirements. But that should be our baseline, not our aspiration. We should be looking to not only appreciate the uniqueness of staff, but show its value in how that person is supported at work and how they're nurtured to grow, develop personally and professionally. I've worked in a setting recently where um, they have identified that some of the people living there would enjoy and would like to have massage and aromatherapy. So rather than bring in strangers, the management are supporting staff who have an interest to gain formal qualifications in aromatherapy. The hopes and dreams of the people we support should marry to the job applications and ultimately the development plans of the people we support. The one-page profiles offer more than a way of working for staff. They're also opportunities for, for example, growth, discovering and acting upon best support, or our social position, recognising and celebrating each other's individuality and how that contributes to social diversity, and purpose, opportunities to share our talents and skills, participation, taking our talents and skills and making use of them in the workplace, solidarity, the more we know about each person in the team, the better the team can work together. All of those elements we recognise as the vital elements of citizenship. In developing our staff this way, we're mirroring all that we want to achieve for the people we also support. But we all know, if your service is starting out to embed person-centred tools, or you're some way down that road, we all know change isn't as easy as it sounds, and I'm not pretending for one minute it is. At times, change can remind us of poor old Sisyphus, condemned for eternity to push a rock up a hill and at times implementing change can feel like this. But it may help to recall Sisyphus's crimes, or at least one of them. He was charged with being deceitful in his relationships. 
Person-centered thinking tools give us a way of overcoming what might feel like an uphill struggle of change by supporting open conversations between organizations, people they support, and staff who support them. Openness, genuineness, is the only way to nurture relationships. So that is the end of um, the, the formal part of the presentation for this webinar. I hope it's been of use to you. Thank you for taking your time out to join me. Before we go on to questions and answers, if there are any, I will say what I'd like you to do is maybe reflect upon um, what you've heard and what you've been thinking about. Perhaps if you can, share it through our Facebook site or with me through Twitter. I'd really love to hear from you and gain some feedback about what you've been thinking as we've gone through. Um, if there are any questions, um, we're open for questions now. I'm just going to leave it open for a minute in case anybody wants to write a question. While we're doing so, what I want to do is to uh, just remind everybody that um, they can sign in to the next webinar. The next webinar is going to focus um, solely on, on family members, how we support family members. Um, often um, with all of the, the skills and attributes that they hold, sometimes they're overlooked and we don't maybe utilize all of the assets that they hold in a way that we could to um, enhance the well-being for people living with dementia in care settings and also those in the community. So that webinar takes place on the 17th of March uh, from 10 o'clock till 11 o'clock in the morning and I hope you're able to join me for that. Um, I'll leave you with our Facebook pages. Uh, my Twitter sign-in as well. I'll be twittering about this and tweeting about this later on in the day. Please do speak to me on Facebook and on our Twitter and share your thoughts and ideas with me. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>